thing on your screen. And uh, see if I can run this up here. Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad to have Sandy Hennem and Rick Weinert here with me uh, and for our newest equip seminar on poverty, homeless, and the church. And Sandy's the direct executive director of the Village of Hope in Bemidji. And uh, we just hope this is a great resource for everyone. I know she's got great information to share. Um, here's a couple things of what we've been doing in these equip seminars. We began back in January. Um, Rural and Missional Suicide Prevention in, in, in February. Bless your community in March. Took a break for the summer. Rick just did one on essential things that have to be in place for change to be implemented without creating chaos last month. Next month, we'll do one with on the value of short-term missions for the local church with friends from International Messengers. And uh, we put all these online. We'll give that information at the end. Um, uh, Sandy, again, the director of executive director of the Village of Hope in Bemidji. If you know Bemidji, uh, Bemidji area, it's just by the post office, not too far to the north. And uh, um, Sandy, I was thinking of these verses this morning for your topic from the book of James, which I had read recently. There's so many scriptures about uh, caring for those in need, and we, we know we got to be careful that we don't make a mistake, but here's, here's some things the scripture says. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. A little later in, 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 in the second chapter, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. One of you says to him, go, uh, uh, be be well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. Pretty strong language from uh, the Apostle James in the, in the New Testament. Um, this is the Village of Hope's website, which you can look up and uh, take a look at, and uh, just a wonderful resource in Bemidji. I remember when the building was built, Sandy, I remember the old house, which is just east of the post office. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Sandy, let you share uh, your presentation and uh, um, you can go for it. Well, good morning, everybody. And this is some strategies for our faith community, building resources to stand in the gap to address poverty. It's not letting me, oh, there we go. So this was the verse that is probably spoken most to me as a Christian. I go to a Lutheran church in Bemidji, was raised as a Lutheran um, in a small community. And this is probably the saddest verse, I think, in the whole Bible. I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap in the wall, but I found no one. And so why, as a Christian, do I choose to stand in the gap? So I was, a, again, I was a small town girl. I grew up in a small town town in northern Minnesota watching my parents and my grandparents and people around us stand in the gap for each other. I also don't have a choice. It's my calling. I sometimes when the burden gets heavy, I wish God would put something different on my heart. He didn't. And he is equipping me as um, he equips us all. And so I don't really have a choice. Um, it's what I was made to do. Quality of life for everyone has always been so very important to me. I spent 30 years in long-term care 
and now I've spent 12 years at Village of Hope, which is an emergency shelter for families. And I have a husband of 33 years and two grown children. And I grew up with this saying from my parents and my grandparents, to whom much is given, much is required. I know that I'm privileged in the sense that I have amazing people around me. I have been given many things and my faith helps me do hard things. I don't know how people do things in this world without faith. I, I don't, I couldn't do it because the Lord is the one that actually is giving me the strength. So why do people have gaps? Well, for the first, for one reason, it's really, really hard to build a wall while you're fighting the things that caused your wall to crumble. If, if you have addiction and you're trying to build that up, if you are in poverty, if you don't have the education, many of our families, most of our families that come to us as adults were homeless as children. So if we can stop that cycle as children, we don't have to have adults that are homeless. We have job loss, we have domestic violence. There are so many things in the world that cause walls to crumble. So why, why is it important that we stand in the gap and, and what does that mean for us as Christians as we kind of go about and do our work? Well, example after example after example, God uses people all the time in the Bible to accomplish his purposes. And if you think back on the people that he uses, it's pretty incredible. They were not always what we would think of as people that could maybe have gotten the job done. And the people he has to do the job many times said, why are you choosing me? I can't get this job done, right? Um, many times over and over again, we're like, please don't choose me. I stutter or I, please don't choose me. So God uses us all the time as his hands and feet. And when we act, God is moved and he will help us continue. So 2 Corinthians really provides a reference for me when I'm standing in the gap. And I think it's really something that we have to take really seriously as a church. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while we're hard pressed, but that there might be equality. God doesn't want us to build somebody else's wall to our own detriment. Sometimes I think, um, as a Christian, I feel like I have to give until I don't have anything left. That's not what God, that's not God's plan for our life. So it's really important as a church community that we ask, how can we address the needs of the under-resourced without negatively impacting the resourced? Or more importantly, hurting the people that we want to help. Sometimes we do things in the name of doing good, and it might actually hurt the people that we're trying to help. So there's a few things I, that we need to know as Christians about poverty. Well, poverty is complicated. I remember when I joined Village of Hope about 12 years ago, the very first thing that I got from the board of directors was the Minnesota state <clears throat> put in poverty in 10 years. And I'm like, this is perfect. I will do this job for 10 years. I'll get homelessness solved and I'll retire. I was there probably by noon. I realized, oh yeah, this isn't going to work. <laughs> um, Poverty is complicated, right? Poverty is so hard to get out of. And poverty really does, there's study after study after study that shows us 
that poverty really challenges our executive functioning skills. We can't think straight, make decisions, um, think through consequences when we're in poverty because so many people in poverty have trauma. And we also know that trauma affects our brains. And the other thing that we need to know is that we can all make a difference. Also, I think as humans, as Christian humans, we feel like, well, I can't give $10,000 or I can't solve homelessness or I can't, but we can all do something. $1, $5, we can um, help. We can go for an afternoon and do something. We don't, we can all make a difference. And the last thing that we really need to think about, which is so hard for helpers, is that we can't do it for people. We have to do it with them. And this is something that I continue to struggle with because I'm like, well, I know what to do. I know how to solve this. I can get this done. And it might not be the solution that works for the person that's sitting in front of me looking in my eyes. So um, especially as Christians, as people who care deeply about other people, it's so hard for us to back, back up and do it with people instead of for them. Because that's why we do what we do, right? We want people's lives to be better. So this is definitely a bridges out of poverty uh, strategy. And the path from poverty to resources really depends on access. We talk about being, people being under-resourced and people being resourced. And so there's just a few things that we have to think about. Obviously people have to have financial resources, but when we think about poverty, that's the one thing that we think about is, well, they don't have enough money, but there's all of these most important things, resources that as a church, we are so good at. We are the people, I just firmly believe with all of my heart that the church is the best of the best at providing these resources to people because that's what God calls us to do. The first thing is emotional. As, as Christians, we, we help, we do this with each other all the time, even when it's hard. We, um, we can help people choose and control their responses without engaging in self-destructive behavior. Sometimes people don't even know that they're self-sabotaging themselves. It's what, it's the only thing they know. As Christians, we can help, we can, we can teach people abilities, we can teach people skills to deal with daily life. Things that I learned as a child from observing my parents other people may, might not have ever had that opportunity because they weren't taught. Spiritual, believing in a divine purpose and a guidance. Motivation, believing in the power of self. If I can't tell you how many times I've looked at an adult and said to them, I am so proud of you. And that's the first time that somebody ever told them that believing in the power of self and others to create a better future. If they know that somebody believes in them, they're so much more apt to believe it um, in, them, in themselves. And as Christians, we, we can do that. Physical, physical health, mobility, support system. As Christians, we can be friends. We can, we can be a backup resource. I was just talking with a friend and we were talking about transportation. And I said, you know, if I got stuck at work, there was a hundred people that I could call and say, my car won't start, will you come and get me? And those 100 people would say, sure, I'm just finishing up something, I'm leaving, right? We have a, at least a hundred people. Well, the people at the shelter maybe have one 
and that person doesn't have a working car or that person doesn't have gas in their car. We can be a support system for others. Certainly we can help people in relationships. We can be role models. We can be friends with people and just give them an opportunity to see friendships and relationships with adults where appropriate, who are able to nurture each other, who don't engage in self-destructive behavior. And the final two are the knowledge of the hidden rules. We know as humanity or that there's just hidden rules, right? Knowing unspoken cues, habits of the group. Each church has their own culture, right? Their own, um, and that's the same with um, people in poverty, people in wealth, and people in middle class. Um, we can help people navigate those. And then the last thing is being a person of integrity, believing in worthiness of self making sure that other people know that they are worthy. And as Christians, we certainly, we can't, as humans, we can't give what we don't have. And so I feel like the Lord has given us all of these things, right? Integrity, spiritual guidance, motivation. We're worthy just because we're his child. And so we can give that worthiness to other people. So when we think about strategies, what strategies really change thinking and starts to build our resources? The very first thing that we know, and as, as pastors, as people of faith, we know relationships is what makes all the difference. Relationships with people different from you when you start to make those connections. When somebody walks into the shelter, they don't really care what we know until they know that we care about them. Once we can build that relationship, then we can start making those changes in their lives. Connections are so important. Other thing that we can do that builds resources is provide emotional, personal experiences. Being with people that are different than us and giving them those pathways in their brain that says, I can trust people. When somebody says they're going to do something, they do it. Um, people are honest. People are do care about me. People don't expect something in return. That is a very powerful strategy. The third thing is, is education, life skills development, practical work skills. Um, we don't have to have a master's in education to teach life skills. Spiritual awakening, being introduced to Christ. This happens to me all the time at the shelter and I, I don't proselytize. I don't, it, it might come up in my, I might wear a piece of jewelry or something, but a family, a, a person will come to me and say, will you pray for me? Or, or they'll say, you're a Christian, right? Um, it's just who we are. It's how we present ourselves in the world. So, so just giving that opportunity as Christians for another person to see Christ in us really builds resources. And then the last thing is employment, being job mentors. Um, attending learning circles or healing circles, we call them. It might be transportation to jobs or giving confidence to apply to a job, to keep a job. Um, there was a person that wanted a job so bad and she was so afraid to go. She'd been rejected so many times. And I said, let's just go together. And so I took half an hour out of my day drove her to her interview, introduced her to the person, and just set that stage. Something probably so easy for us was so hard for her. So how can we start to build relationships? I love this saying, 
We'll never change the world by going to church. We'll only change the world by being the church. And I, I'm singing to the choir when I'm saying this to the people that will, will listen to this um, because we know that we're the church, right? So how do we stand in the gap by being the church? Well, the first thing is that we can join others that are doing the work. We have Village of Hope. We have Churches United. We have, um, I see that my friend Matt is on the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. Um, we can join a state coalition of other people that are doing good work. We can believe and have faith in human potential as children of God. It's so important that we believe in that, that human potential. So what are the characteristics of human capacity development, which is what um, we believe in at Village of Hope. That's, this is kind of our strategy. The well, first thing is, is that we focus on people's knowledge. We focus on their thinking. We focus on their understanding. Then we know that if we interact, that builds on that one-to-one -one relationship of mutual respect with people different than you. Um, we, know, we didn't all grow up in the same way, um, with the same experiences, with the same opportunities. So when we start interacting with people of, with mutual respect, that really tells us about human development, human capacity. We can assign a language to talk about an experience. We all have different experiences. And sometimes we don't even know how that experience might be affecting us or might affect the person that is sitting across from us looking at people. So it's really important that we help people assign a language to that experience. Something like, and again, I'm singing to the choir because you guys do this all the time um, as uh, you know, people of faith, but you look really upset. Tell me more about that. Let them assign a language to really talk about their experience without re-traumatizing is a really important thing. Human capacity development also tells us the high and wow, the how. We know that people in trauma are affected um, physically, mentally, socially. And it relates to and it reframes the individual's personal life. When we think about that all humans have amazing capacity for growth, that helps us think about people and ourselves in a different way but it also helps us think about other people and it helps them reframe what they're doing. I remember a mother of six, she'd raised six girls and her last one was going to kindergarten. And so she, when she came to the show, she's like, I really want to get a job, but I've never done anything. <laughs> I'm like, all right, wait now, you've raised six girls yes, you've done something. So let's talk about organization. Let's talk about budget. Let's talk about um, human relations. Let's, and all of a sudden her eyes just got huge. And she's like, I'm really good. I said, yes, you are. Who, what person wouldn't want a mother of six girls in there? Let me tell you, they could problem solve, right? And so it helped us reframe. It helped her really reframe her experiences. When we think about human capacity, we also think about providing tools to move away from crisis. That's what we're doing right now. Um, Jim and I are both Rotarians. That's one of our projects that we're doing as Rotarians. We are working with amazing people in the Ridgeway neighborhood and we're providing them tools. We're not doing it to them or for them, we are doing it with them. We are providing relationship building in the terms of picnics. And we're providing some different job training. Um, we're doing learning circles. 
um, we're doing some support groups. We're really, the group that I'm working with really wants to, to talk about doing a neighborhood watch. And so I am leading that, I'm facilitating it, but they're thinking about how they want this to form and how they want this to work. And so as Christians, we can do something that we think is fairly small. We can spend an hour serving at a picnic or, or helping a learning circle, but that is huge. We don't have to be Mother Teresa, right? Um, to help people change their lives. Human capacity development also allows, allows for personal choice, which is the one that I probably struggle with the most, um, being a rule follower that I am, being, um, it's, it's like, these are your options, make your choice. And then they make the choice, and you're like, mm, okay. That, you know, you, we have to sometimes back away from, from being attached to a choice that people make. It is their choice to make. And boy, I'm, that's my hardest thing as a Christian, I think, is to allow people to make their own choices. Human capacity also has a future story at an individual level. We are always helping people think about the future. When you are in poverty, when you're in crisis mode, when you're just trying to get your basic needs met every day, when you're just trying to figure out, how do I get my kids to school? Um, how, where am I gonna sleep tonight? Um, am I gonna find someplace safe? What am I gonna have to do for that safe place? It is so hard to think about the future. And so as Christians, if we can join around and help people think about a future story that there is, as Christians, that's what we're all thinking about, right? Is, is that future that we have. And so all of these human capacity results in the development of resources. And that's, and we know that resources are the most important thing that we can surround people with. And this also really, one of the things that is so important to me is the Bridges Out of Poverty training. I do, I am a Bridges Out of Poverty trainer. And so I can come into any place for free and do um, that Bridges Out of Poverty. I felt like that was really an important step that I could take um, to help my Christian brothers and sisters is to be able to give that. So um, I am a Bridges Out of Poverty trainer. And like I said, I will come in anywhere and um, do that for free because it's very important. Why, why do I believe that the human capacity, human capacity um, works? Well, when human capacity is increased, People have the ability to create their own resource base and have the ability to start being self-sustaining. We can be alongside people. Um, they can take care of their own needs and then reach back and help other people that need resources. The other thing that I think is really important, especially for me as a Christian, is that it promotes dignity. It promotes people's well-being and it gives them the opportunity to continue their development. And people start to give back to others. We know that when we volunteer, we get so much more than we give. And when we start to build capacity, when we start to build development, people can go into any environment and start to negotiate rather than being afraid of something that's different. And that's for all of us, I think. And then the last thing that human capacity does for us is that as Christians, it helps us grow spiritually. When we're, when we're face to face with something 
that challenges our growth or challenges our belief system or causes us to believe different or it really is going to help us grow spiritually. So as I'm thinking about the human capacity development model, Jesus really did provide us with the perfect human capacity development model. Think about how he engaged with the people. He went to them, right? He walked from place to place. He got in boats. He went to the people. And that is really something that I think, especially with the Rotary Project, we're doing. We're going to the people. We're not expecting people to try to figure out how to get to us for help. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Mark 12, 31. It, it inputs our knowledge, our thinking, and our understanding based on relationships. Jesus was about connections. Connections with people that were like him, but more often than not, people that were very different than him. In Galatians, he says, Carry each other's burdens, and this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Sometimes we do need to carry the burden. Sometimes the gap is too big. And so we're not saying to the people, okay, you just sit in the lawn chair and I'll build your wall. What we do is we say, okay, I'm going to stand in this gap and, and don't let anything else in your wall, in your family, in your life. You go out and find a job. You go out and find housing. I'll still be here, right? Sometimes we need to teach each other how to carry that burden. Um, sometimes it's a burden. I was just in a group with my team and we were talking about when is it our baggage to pick up? And when is it our baggage to put down? When is it? When is it okay to pick up somebody else's baggage? And is it ever okay to pick up somebody's baggage? Um, and so sometimes we just need to teach each other how to carry that burden. And it might just be standing aside with them in the gap. Say, I can't, I can't build your wall, but I can be here and not let anything else in. It focuses on knowledge, understanding, and again, reframing that person's life as if we can help our brothers and sisters see their, their experiences, their life in a different way, that will give them the strength many times. And then Luke 11, 9, ask and it shall be given to you, seek and you will find a knock and the door will be open. Again, it's one-to-one -one relationships of mutual respect with different people. We know that disciples were very different from each other, right? Jesus made connections everywhere he met, everywhere he, everywhere he went with everyone he met. He didn't, uh, he didn't pick and choose. Sometimes people chose not to have a relationship with him, but he went anyway. You know, very famous. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son who shall ever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then Isaiah. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Oftentimes when we work as Christians outside of the church to be the church, it does give us spiritual awakening. And it tests, it, it, we soon, soon learn that we can't rely on ourselves. It's poverty, homelessness, it's too big. It really does need a miracle. Deuteronomy, I must give as they are able, according to the blessings given to them by the Lord, your God. For me, the word is able, right? We all have financial blessings, but we all have many other things that are important to us. But 
it's teaching people how to be able. And it's saying, I'm able to do this. Somebody next to me is able to do that. I can't judge what I'm able to do against their able to do. And I think as Christians, we really have to think about that because we get into comparison. Um, and so if we can just take a step back and say, this is what I'm able. And we have different seasons in our life where we're able to give more, to do more. And then there are seasons in our life where we maybe need other people to be more able than we are. Is um, on my desk at work. Um, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is hard work. The things that we do as a church, not only poverty, all the things that we do as a church, it's hard. It's hard work. And so I always look to my Christian brothers and sisters for support, for encouragement, for being in relationship with them, for helping me when I when I need encouragement, when I say, this is too hard, God send somebody else, I can't do this today, I will call a Christian brother or sister and they'll say, okay, just, you know, Jesus took a nap and they just sent me a, you know, Daniel slept in the lion's den and like, take a nap and it will be okay. Everybody sleeps. And so, um, Sometimes we just need that encouragement um, from another per person of faith to say, stay in it. It's going to be um, okay. Also have this um, on my desk at work. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Um, emotional support, mental um, the things that we do as Christians in the long game, we don't always see the outcome of that. Um, sometimes somebody will come back to us at the shelter um, and tell us how we've impacted their lives, tell us um, or we'll see them. Or many times I've had people that have been in the shelter that I have hired. Um, and so you get to see that impact, but many times we don't, and we can't let that make us weary as Christians. We, we have to keep doing what we're doing. So now what? Um, you know, as humans, we have grown up. We were kind of, we're kind of created to be in circles of intimacy and in circles of friendship in circles of participation. We exchange with each other. This is, I consider this, what you guys are doing with Equip, a circle of support, right? You're sharing the journey. Um, and so sometimes as Christians, we can create circles of support for people. And it doesn't have to be formal, it can be formal. But being there for another person is definitely a person of support. Um, the book Rick and I were, or Jim and I were just talking about When Helping Hurts, that book. It's, it's a very interesting book. And um, these are the things that I really pulled out from the book. Um, they say that poverty is rooted in people's broken relationships with God, with self, with others, and with the rest of creation. So that, that's part of it, right? That's that individual piece. But then there's other pieces, systemic. These relationships are broken due to complex combination of, as we all sin, right? We might make poor choices, but there's also an injustice um, in our systems that, that frankly keeps people down. And um, so we have to work on both of those. There's definitely a systemic piece that keeps people in poverty. 
And there's so much more that meets the eye. So while it's really important that, I mean, if people don't have food, if they don't have clothing, um, we can't get far because people's basic needs absolutely need to be met. But there's so much more going on. There's so much more solutions that as Christians, we can take on. And I've said this before, anybody that, that has heard me or talked with me, as Christians, I feel like we are the best and the brightest to be able to tackle these things. It's so important that we come together as um, Christians to tackle these things. I think about St. Vincent de Paul and the work that the Catholic Church is doing around this area. Um, we have, our, we have um, an organization right here in Bemidji that we work very close with. Um, and they are doing the work. Um, they are the hands and feet. They are taking it to the streets, so to speak. And um, if anybody's interested in volunteering or being part of that organization, please reach out to um, the St. Philip's Church or the um, St. Vincent de Paul. They would be, I know they would be glad to, to um, visit with you because it's really important that as Christians, we, we don't have to invent something. We don't have to create something. We don't even have to do it on our own uh, besides I would say, don't do it on your own. It's too hard. But we can join other people that are already doing the work and frankly need need more people to help us in that journey. So there's there's just some important things to know. Work with, not for, or to. Um, I, when I'm working with my group, oftentimes they say to me, um, nothing for us without us. And I just really keep that in my forefront when my helping bone gets really um, jazzed. I, I um, have to calm down my helping bone and just say, okay, nothing, no, I can't do this for them. Because my experience has shown me over and over again that people in poverty are the experts in their life. They generally know what to do. They are so resilient, so smart. They just don't have the resources to do it. They'll tell you what they need to do. They just don't have the resources to get there. For sure, judgment will stop the process of yourself and of other people. If we if we judge ourselves, it's not good enough, or it's only this, or that's going to stop the process. And if, if we judge other people's choices, that's going to um, stop the process. And I'm for sure talking to myself about that. I have to do, I have to definitely do some scolding and, and let people make their own choices. The thing that I also know that I know that I know is that everybody is just doing the best they can, you included. Everybody is doing the best we can. The other thing I know for sure is that lasting change takes time. We are a society of instant, right? I mean, the microwave wasn't fast enough, so we had to go to this Instapot thing, right? Um, we want things immediate. and that's not how life works. And we just have to take a breath and just know that we are doing God's work. So some things that I ask myself um, when I'm thinking about standing in the gap for somebody, with somebody, um, I kind of ask myself these questions and it's really helped me uh, on my journey. So am I able to understand another point of view without judgment? Am I able to keep the focus and the interests on the families or on the individuals that I'm working with? Am I excited about building community with the family? Do I even have time? Do I have time to assist a community or an individual? Maybe at, you know, four, four hours a month, maybe. 
Am I able to keep everything I see and hear confidential? Barring any personal issues, am I able to commit? It's so important when we take on a project or when we think about it, that we are in it for the long haul, especially people in poverty. It's like the flavor of the month or here somebody else comes with their idea that they're, um, I have literally been called every name in the, names that I didn't even know existed, I have been called. Um, uh, you know, I've had people slam the door, I've had people walk away, I've had people do horrible things, but I'm there the next day. And they, need to know without a shadow of a doubt that we're going to be with them because that goes back to helping people know that they're worthy helping people um, build those different kinds of experiences now we also need to know as christians when to walk away um, right and so i'm not saying don't stay in a relationship or don't stay in the gap with somebody um, if your life is threatened, if, you know, I'm talking about um, people that are just um, angry with me or frustrated, things like that. Um, and they come back and they usually say, I'm really sorry. But the thing that we know is that it's not about us. It's not about us, it's about them. So am I willing to stick with people even when they make mistakes, even when they don't make the choice that I would choose that clearly is right, right in my head? It's like, well, of course, I know. Am I willing to stick with those with people even when they make mistakes? And sometimes the things that I think are going to be a disaster turn out beautifully. And I'm like, I'm so glad they made that choice. Here's just some statistics that, um, so does standing in the gap work? Well, when we think about the work that we have done, um, we've been, we've seen with the people that we've worked with that we have helped people increase their income by 39% after six months, 54% after more than a year, and 75% after 18 months if we stick with this process. 13% increase in part-time employment, 49% increase in full-time employment, 22% increase in housing, and 35% decrease in shelter, which, all, which is my deal, right? And people are like, you're an executive director of an emergency shelter. Why would you want a decrease in shelter, right? I want to work myself out of a job. I want the board to come to me and say, we had a great run. We don't need you. If I could get, you know, a hundred percent decrease in shelter, I would be a happy girl. Eighteen percent increase in transportation after six months, twenty-seven percent after twelve months, and thirty-six percent after eighteen months. And the United Way is doing an amazing wheels to work program which um, is going to be so helpful, I think, as we continue on this journey. So, join a local group already working. We have so many people, um, but the things that I know for sure that um, are thinking about Village of Hope, the Rotary, you know, the Ridgeway Project, St. Vincent de Paul, Churches United, the Food Shelf. We have so many organizations in the Bemidji and the Minnesota, the Northern Minnesota area that are standing in, in the gap. Join one of those. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just wanted to highlight a little bit about our Rotary Ridgeway Neighborhood Program because this is um, something unique and I'm so proud of it. Um, it was formed after the Alina uh, Phillips neighborhood project. So that is down in the cities. And that was the neighborhood that George Floyd was um, killed in. 
So it's a particularly um, inner city um, neighborhood. And, and they've done this for like 20 years. So we're following kind of their process. Um, you don't need to be a Rotarian to participate. But one thing that we're seeing more than anything is that violence is making it really hard for people to get ahead. We want them to come to things. We want them, and they are afraid. <clears throat> they are um, afraid um, to talk to the police. They're afraid to come um, and reach out for resources because they know, I had one person say to me, you never know who's looking. You never know who's watching. And so we have worked at Ridgeway now for a year building those relationships, putting resources in, just like Jesus did, we're going to the people. And Sanford has rented in an apartment for us on site so we can bring those resources right to them. And then to end it, I'm gonna end it how I began it. I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone to stand in the gap, but I found no one. And, and I know as a church that together we can stand in the gap. We don't have to do things alone. Thank and you. that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Sandy. If you want to close that out, we'll get our screens big again here. Thank you very much. Um, and Rick or Matt, uh, Matt's got a question for Rick. If we think of some questions that might uh, some of our friends and contacts might be asking, um, Sandy, thank you especially for sharing stuff about the Ridgeway apartment uh, neighborhood. For those of you from Bemidji, if you don't know what we're talking about, Ridgeway Avenue is intersects Paul Bunyan Drive right by Perkins, and the Ridgeway. I just think there's Sandy. You correct me on any of this. You know more than I. Uh, I think there's four apartment complexes in that Ridgeway neighborhood. And according to our police department, it's the highest crime rate area in Bemidji. And a very collaborative community team um, led by Rotary, Sanford Health involved, our police chief involved, city council members. Um, so pretty, pretty amazing, but pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Um, and Sandy, I'm encouraged to hear that, that one of the requests is for a neighborhood watch that it just seems like it's gotta be safer for people to live there for a change Thanks. to happen. So, um, and, uh, so people from out of town, they might have a different, uh, different issues, but that's a Bemidji specific one there. And. As Sandy mentioned, both she and I are members of our, of our Noon Rotary Club. It's a great group of community leaders. I, I just appreciate that group of community leaders from diverse backgrounds and, and, and professions trying to work together to solve problems. And, uh, so, Rick, you think of any questions you might have? Um, Sandy, I know you, you referenced this book, When Helping Hurts, so you understand it. This is one we gave out at our Native Ministry Conference, uh, led by our uh, co-led by our Center for Indian Ministries team this summer. Uh, for me, Sandy, one of the things that stands out is the difference between relief and development, and how we tend it's easier to do relief work, yes, than it is to do development work. Development work is longer. It's hard. <laughs> harder, like what you're saying. Relief is kind of kind of in and out. And um, um, so, uh, but I think sometimes the, the authors of the book talk about um, people have misinterpreted their work to say helping hurts people, so don't help them. No, 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 that's not the point. It's uh, sometimes we tend to do relief work and we should be doing development work and that hurts them, keeps them independent. So. Uh, and I not, think to be really clear, we need both. Yeah. You know, relief work is often <clears throat> those basic needs. If you can't have your basic needs, you can't get your developed. You can't, yeah. you know, safety is a clear example. 
if if you don't feel safe no. you can't grow if you're starving you can't grow so yeah. um and the book says yes clearly we need both yeah i i experienced relief work uh, personally after we had the 2012 terrible storm here in Bemidji. Uh, what's the, the first time I'd heard the word direco, the, or uh, this, this sustained wind. It was like a hurricane force wind for 30 minutes. And my wife and I and our youngest daughter were sheltered in our basement. I thought we were going to lose our home. Um, when it finally passed, uh, with July 2012, um, I went out. We live in the woods. Uh, I long driveway, I assessed, uh, you know, the damage and realized, okay, the house didn't get hit, but our, our driveway is completely blocked. I can't get to help or help anybody unless I clear this driveway. I grab my chainsaw. Um, I start cutting. I get about halfway down my driveway and it's getting dark. And I hear someone, I shut the saw for a second. I hear someone say, Jim, is that you? And it was neighbors cutting the other way. And we met in the middle of our driveway. Those neighbors have never needed to come over to help me with anything else because I don't need their help. I don't need their help to cut firewood, but I needed their help to clear our driveway in a crisis. Um, so th that was an example of relief work um, that I needed, we needed. But the good, good for pastors, uh, ministry leaders, church leadership teams, get a hold of this book uh, to, to consult with you, Sandy. Um, just contact the Village of Hope. It's hard even on church benevolent teams sometimes to know, should we help this person again? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Um, or not. Uh, but if we get involved in trying to help them learn, it's going to take a lot of work. So, yeah. Rick, any thoughts that you've got? I, I just appreciated, Sandy, the the focus on um, valuing those that we're helping and, and helping them to see their own value. Um, they, they, they are humans and as such created in the image of God. And we, we sometimes lose that. We sometimes, I think, forget that. Um, we begin to look at them as a project um, rather than as as someone created in the in the image of God with value, and so, so thank you for focusing on that and 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 um, including that in, in your presentation. I think that's really important. You're welcome. Yeah. So Sandy, say if uh, and, and this this seminar could be seen by people, you know, all over northern Minnesota. So, um, so if someone encounters. Like last month, we had a, a Bagley pastor ask us as we were starting our, our prior seminar, what do I do? A uh, woman's approached me to say she's going to become homeless this week. Uh, how do I help her? So your home area, Halstead, mm -hmm. on, on the way to Moorhead, on the edge of the Red River Valley. Um, I grew up in Cavalier on the North Dakota side of the valley. Rick pastored in Bagley. Um, Part of a church in in, in Walker. I, I'm in Bemidji. What if you're in, in Black Duck or Park Rapids or Cass Lake or Bina or someone approaches you and says, "I'm homeless um, or I don't have transportation." How? What's a first step or a first uh, first point of reference you'd give? You talk a lot about the collaboration between these professionals in our region. And uh, a lot of pastors, they, they collaborate with other pastors, but sometimes the, the ministry sector and the social service sector don't always know each other real well, even though there's Christians working in this one. Well, what's, what's, what's the kind of a first point of advice you give when, when you encounter when a pastor or leader would encounter someone in desperate need? Can, can you help me now? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing probably would be to reach out to your county seat. Most counties have a social service component, um, you know, whether it's Monoman County or Beltrami County, Clearwater County, every county has a county seat. And as part of 
that county, there is a health and human service component to that. So that would be my first thought. Um, the second thought would be, um, typically they have um, by caps or cap agencies. That would definitely be my second um, choice. I mean, right up in there, you know, we have Tri-Valley, um, we have ICAP, what does the cap? I know what BICAP is in Bemidji, but when you say cap agency, it's got to be an acronym for something. It is, and I just, <laughs> I'm not sure what. Yeah, okay. isn't that funny? I'm um, assistance um, community assistance programs. Okay. I knew just, I would have it in my brain. If um, so you mentioned BICAP, you mentioned the county. Um, if if uh, if a pastor were to ask you, what is a list of phone numbers that I should just have available on my on my desk or in my wallet in, in case I encounter a need? What would be? You don't need to give us the numbers, but what would be some of the um, some of the agencies that, that we ought to look up for and, and just make a list of? Uh, yeah, for sure, your cap agency. Um, your health and human service portion. Um, uh, I would say you probably all have these, but any of your emergent, you know, um, mental health, um, you know, the 1 800 for mental health, the 1 800 number for suicide. We have a wonderful um, organization in Bemidji called Community Resource Connections. And um, that is not, um, I happen to have a, a um, printed copy of all the resources, but they have them on um, the web, it's web-based. And so if you go to CRC or Community Resource Connections, that is a wonderful place to start. Thank now, you. For home, yeah. now for homeless shelters, um, there's something that's called No Wrong Door. So let's say somebody in Park Rapids calls our shelter. We, we don't say to them, or somebody that, that is a single male, we don't say to them, sorry, we don't serve single males, good luck. Or sorry, you're out of our region, um, good luck with that. Um, we have a very specific process for the state of Minnesota. And again, it's called No Run Door. And we have a, um, if you called my shelter, if you called the shelter, um, you know, in the cities, if you, you're gonna get the same exact questions asked to you. And um, that helps the person that answers the phone really start to think about what do they, what do they really need? What are they asking for? And um, then we assign telephone numbers to all of those resources that we have. And um, we make sure, we can't always help everybody, obviously, but we make sure that the, the person has the resources that they need before they hang up that phone. Yeah. And so any, um, the other, the, another good example would be to call 211. 211 is, is the information in our region, in our Northern Minnesota region, you're gonna get a real person on the phone that um, can give you those resources or can, um, sometimes we even get a num we even get that number, they'll just transfer it to us. Yeah. Um, so 211 is another really good resource. That's helpful, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds like the book of James, you know, chapter two of uh, be warm, well fed, see ya no <laughs> let's help you find that no that's good sandy um you know and i in bemidji churches united uh i'm on their board wanda yeoman's uh great great person great director She's there such a resource and and uh she, she has a flyer that'll list all these other resources in this region but i i do think this this is great to hear about this no wrong door um, and I want to well, encourage that's just for emergency shelters. I yeah. Yeah. Right. we know that homelessness is a big issue in yeah. our region. Yeah. 
And it's getting colder. We had 19 degrees the other night, and I would not, I wouldn't have wanted to be in my deer stand all night, uh, right. any night like that, any breeze. And I think Rick and I would, would like to say to pastors, wherever you're at, we want you to, of course, we want you to network with other pastors, but we still urge you find out where these people are, like Sandy uh, or like Danae Alamano, our head of our United Way, who are love Jesus and are serving in these, these social service organizations and want to connect with the church mm -hmm. we, and, and know that the problems are too big for any one organization or one sector to solve. And I, I just repeatedly, Sandy, uh, and, and Rick knows this as my teammate, uh, I just keep finding open doors as a Christian leader when, when I get involved in more community organization things that they want the church to be at the table um, don't necessarily want us to be in charge but we don't have the expertise of that but to be at the table to be a contributor even on the say this rotary neighborhood um, uh, i think everyone who cares is welcome to try to help be a solution there in that tough that tough block mm -hmm. um, um, well we will we will um, you know, put this resource on our website, and we'll we'll share your presentation in summary, Sandy. And uh, uh, great, great to have your friend Matt join in there. And uh, we hope many, many will uh, get to see this. And uh, Rick, any other questions or any questions, Sandy, you have for us too? Um, I don't think so. Okay, we'll get this out to our net of the north and others. And I just think, particularly as we're going into winter. This is really valuable to know about all over the region. Uh, no one wants to see, no one wants to do what James is challenging in, in his letter to say, be blessed, but can't help you. They, they wanna do what's right uh, and know. Uh, they, they, wanna, they wanna do helping that helps, not helping that hurts. So. Yeah. Let me uh, let me go to some closing slides here of some things. Pull them up here. Um, I will run through here. Um, oops, got to get it to go here. It's just not going on me for some reason. Well, I'll scroll through them this way. So uh, here's the book, When Helping Hurts. You can see that. Uh, you can access that uh, in multiple ways. Great book. Enjoyed reading it. Here's the Churches United's um, website, Wanda, uh, Wanda Yeoman's Leads. Um, here's some Oak Hills uh, website info where our resources are, where you could help us with, with a resource. Uh, here's the page where we'll put our conferences and resource info, and then specifically the equipped conference uh, information will be here. So uh, the next one coming up uh, will be uh, in November uh, on short-term missions for the local church. So I'm glad we've got an emphasis on local and, and abroad here to talk about. And then Rick and I are figuring out what we'll do in the new year. So um, I'll uh, close those out. So Sandy, thank you so much for taking the time on your day off. Thank your husband, your cat, uh, <laughs> just everybody else that was helpful to uh, your family, you thank your, your co-workers there. You, you run a great organization in town and you're a great networker. Um, and um, and uh, Rick, would you, uh, yeah, Rick, would you just close us in prayer? Yeah, yeah, let's pray. Father, thank you for Sandy and for others that are working so hard in this area of, of poverty and homelessness. And um, I, I pray that as the people, a people of God, you would give us a greater understanding of the need, that you would give us um, your eyes, your heart, and that you give discernment and wisdom as we serve that um, truly might be the hands of Christ. 
to those in need. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Harold. <clears throat>